We are now up to key issue three in chapter three. And the question for key issue three is why do migrants face obstacles? When we talk about those obstacles, we're usually talking about what the host country makes policies on in dealing with immigration. In the case of America, we have quota policies that go into place. And a quota is a law or a policy that limits how many people will come in from a country or another specific region. The United States has had two really specific examples of this. The first was called the Chinese Exclusion Act from 1882. This policy or law really lived up to its name. It excluded Chinese from moving into our country, especially low-wage workers. Around that same time period, we had something called the Gentlemen's Agreement. And this excluded Japanese coming into our country. The reason why it was a little bit different and nicer sounding was we asked Japan to limit the people coming into our country. So we never really made the policy. We had Japan kind of enforce it. In both cases, people that were professional workers were still occasionally allowed into our country. It was just trying to limit people that would work for less wages than the average American. Throughout this section, it continuously talks about specific numbers. It throws a lot of specific numbers at you. Don't worry about memorizing those exact numbers. It's just trying to give you an idea. Finally, it wraps up in this section talking about America and the migrants that come into here and who we allow in. When America allows people in today, usually about three quarters of the immigrants that come into America today are to reunify families. So if part of the family lives here, the United States is a little bit open to allowing other family members to come in and join. If you are a skilled worker or a professional, so you have a specific job you can do effectively, or you're like a college degree graduate, America is more likely to allow you in, and you get the priority to entering America. This is also where we learn the term brain drain, because America will allow these college graduates to come into our country where they're more likely to live a better life and make more money, but those home countries are losing a lot of their college graduates. They're losing a lot of their highly educated and skilled people. So we call that brain drain. Finally, America does allow refugees to come into our country, but we're very strict about that. You really have to prove that it's a life or death scenario on why you are coming to America. So in 2015, Cubans coming to our country, we consider political refugees. However, People from other countries that might be poor, maybe from El Salvador or Argentina, they cannot declare refugee status because it's purely for economic reasons why they're coming here. Temporary migration for work is something that's a little bit more focused on with Europe. This is a more of a common activity in Europe. And in Western Europe, they allow somebody called a guest worker. Guest workers are workers that have temporary permits to work in that country, usually for seasonal work. They then will then go back home. Usually North Africans and people from Southwest Asia are the typical guest workers for Western Europe. This is a kind of a good system how they work together because Western Europe gets the cheap labor and temporary labor and many times these workers do go home because they know they can go back to their families, they can take the money and send it back and bring it back with them. It's also very popular because the workers know that if they abuse it, it can be withdrawn, it can be gotten away with. So there's a lot of compliance to these policies. Now the money that is sent back home, it does not directly talk about this in our book, but the term is remittances. Remittances is money made in a foreign country that is then gathered up and sent back home to the people's families there. That way they're getting a lot more money than they would if they stayed home in their home country. So now we're going to talk about the main difference between an economic migrant and a refugee. And America really does take a look at this. Economic migrants are those that come to a country to better their financial status, to improve their way of life. A refugee is typically running for their lives. If they stay back in their home country, they will die or be put to death for you know, multiple reasons, religion, political, uh, because they're speaking out against the government. There are three areas that are focused on in this section, Cuba, Haiti, and Vietnam.
So let's take a look at Cuba first. Since 1959, we have considered Cubans political refugees. So we created a policy called wet foot, dry foot. When Fidel Castro took over and made it a communist region, a lot of people started fleeing for their lives. Well, this wet foot, dry foot policy was put in. And what it means is that anybody from Cuba, and Cuba is the only country on earth that we allow this from, but anybody from Cuba that can make it under dry soil here in America can stay and we will give them residency. This is very important because if you ever see sometimes TV shows, movies, news, you will see that there are political refugees from Cuba trying to make it onto our shore and they get tackled while they're still in the water. Even if it's like ankle deep, knee deep, if they are apprehended, we can send them back. And many times we do that. If they can actually make it to the full dry part of the soil, then they are allowed to stay here and they can apply for citizenship. One of the biggest movements from Cuba was called the Mariel Boat Lift. And this was one of the biggest migrations into our country, especially in recent times. 125,000 migrants from Cuba made it to America and were allowed to stay. Again, they were considered political refugees because they were considered fleeing for their lives. Haiti has been very kind of controversial in this because Haitians are considered economic reasons. Even when they had some brutal dictators in their past, like Papa Doc, when they were fleeing to America, we still considered them only economic refugees, and usually they were sent back to Haiti. The final example that our book discusses is Vietnam. And Vietnam has always been considered economic refugees as well. Even though they have a communist government, and many times the people are oppressed, usually they are considered an economic refugee. There have been a few exceptions. One was when there was an era called the boat people, and a bunch of Vietnamese got into boats and sailed off trying to get harbor into America, and many of them were given permission to come here and live. The last part of our key issue talks about the views of immigration and the views of immigrants, especially into the United States and Europe. In the United States, since 1920, we've seen an increase in the attitude and the negativity towards immigrants and how they are portrayed. Well, that was not a modern day thing. That has gone on around our country. In the early 1900s, there were signs hung up that said Nina. Nina was no Irish need apply. Irish were really seen as being like bottom feeders of the immigrants coming into our country. Not long after the Irish Italians started moving into our country, and those signs applied to the Italians, and they were seen in very negative light. So we have seen throughout American history that there has been a lot of times different groups picked on, isolated, and uh, blamed for economic woes. Today we see those attitudes taken out on Mexicans and people from Southwest Asia, especially those who are Muslim. But that's not a distinctly American thing. The guest workers in Europe can be also treated that way as well. They can be disliked, they're looked down upon. And an interesting thing that's happening in Europe is that they're going through what we went through in this country in our late 1800s and early 1900s. They're seeing these guest workers come in either temporarily or later on permanently, and they're forming their own neighborhoods, and they're forming their own newspapers, and they're not learning the native language of that country. And we're starting to see even in Europe that there's a lot of negativity and attitude shown towards these workers.